This is part of the Colorado River Board of California Oral History Project. It is April the 13th, 2009, and we're talking to Bob Shemp, a former employee at Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. Bob, thanks for giving us some time today. Uh, I, I know this is going to be, become an interesting part of the of the uh, Oral History Project's library, and especially since you're coming from a slightly different uh, uh, point of view, because we're going to be talking about power today for the most part, uh, rather than water. But before we get into that, uh, let's talk a little bit about how you wound up at Metropolitan. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background. My background went to Cal Poly Pomona, uh, majored in mathematics, and Needed a part-time job getting through school one summer. And what year are we talking about? It? We're talking about 1968. And uh, to continue paying for the bills, I took a job with Met, actually in the soils lab, compacting dirt on the backfill on the second floor feeder. And that company was a pretty good company to work for, so after I graduated from school, I decided to go back to work in the soils lab and. Instead, they suggested I work in L.A. And with that, a very influential person in my life, Bob Whaley, was the Colorado River Aqueduct engineer at the time, and kind of took me under his wing and led me down the direction of power, pretty much doing much of the legwork on a lot of the activities out on the aqueduct, as well as the power end of the activities, everything from routine billing monthly. I think back then our annual power bill was like eight million dollars a year, which I know we'd like to have right now, but it's nowhere near there. And so I came up pretty well through the operations uh, end of it, but by 1975, I think it was, I wanted to get more into the contract negotiations and more of that type of activity, and so I had a change of vein and moved over to resources. And while over there, I went back to school and picked up my registration in electrical engineering. Um, and from that point forward, worked pretty well focused on many of the power resources Metropolitan has, everything from the renegotiation of our Hoover contract, amendments to our Parker power contract, uh, the development of the contracts for the small hydroelectric power projects internal to our distribution system. And integral to much of that was learning some of the background relative to the Colorado River supplies as well, which were integral to our pumping operation. And then moving into the 80s, I became more focused on many of the power supplies related to the state water project, which are the major portion of our power costs now. And I guess it was in the mid-80s that uh, Myron Holbert and Carl were encouraging me to get more into the water supply issues, and that's when they involved me in the Imperial Irrigation District negotiations. But before I took a focus venue over in that regard to focusing more on the water supplies, I indicated I wanted to stay in the power arena since that was pretty well where I cut my teeth and I had started work on the renegotiation of our Hoover contract after that expired in 50 years. And I wanted to see that job through, which finally came to fruition in 87 when the contract expired and was renewed for another 30 years. But between 84 and I guess 87, 88, um, I was involved in the IID negotiations for our first conservation agreement with Imperial and learned many of the players over on the Colorado River uh, entities and pretty well kept my fingers in that through the first land following program with Palo Verde, uh, first pilot groundwater storage program over in Arizona until about the mid-90s, uh, might have been 96 or so, and at that time the um, power industry was going through a major change where they were 
basically selling off the transmission, forming an independent system power operator, and changing the forefront. And at that time, it was pretty well decided that I needed to focus totally on power issues. I pretty well did that until I retired in 2000. Uh, as an aside, when you started with MET, was the headquarters above Grand, Cent Grand Central or was it already over at Sunset Boulevard? It was already at Sunset in 68. Uh, I think they had been there for one or two years. Okay. I, I thought you might have been one of those rare employees that worked at all four, uh, four headquarters locations, but okay, fine. Uh, before we move on to the specific, some of the specific projects that you mentioned, let's talk a minute about the uh, uh, the change that took place, at least in California, that affected you with the ISO and the independent, you know, that that whole, you mentioned it, the whole a whole different way of distributing and paying for power. Can you, is there any way to describe that in a nutshell? In other words, what was it before and what was it after? Prior to the power restructuring, each utility had a service area and through that, they went through the Public Utilities Commission to earn a certain rate of return because they had a, they basically other utilities could not come into their service area and steal their customers and their rate base. They go out and they spend billions of dollars, something like what MET does on its aqueducts and what have you. And then if somebody came in and decided to sell water in competition with us, they'd basically take away our revenue source and we'd be stuck with the capital and have to have the remaining entities pick up the big bucks. So prior to this restructuring in the power business, each utility, Edison Company had a service area, San Diego Gas and Electric had their service area, but dotted throughout that area in Southern California were a number of entities that provided their own power. Metropolitan was pretty much unique in that it had its own power sources and had its own loads and transmission line out in the desert. The resale cities, Anaheim, uh, Glendale, Burbank, Pasadena, they had their own little service areas which were kind of windows that were unique of their own, that they had their own power resources, transmission, and retail loads. The real change that existed was that the utilities wanted to get out of providing the power and the transmission responsibilities. They had a certain responsibility to serve. They would go out and put billions of dollars into rate base. And then the Public Utilities Commission, through various processes, would disallow certain amounts in rate base and what have you. And they thought that through competition, that in the new industry, everybody could provide the competition that would keep the rates low and that the utilities wouldn't have to take the risk and the Public Utilities Commission wouldn't have to sit over that part of the rate making. And so that's why they developed the independent system operator to provide the transmission grid to get the power from the generator to the, to the transmission grids. I mean, Edison still serves a certain area, but they only have the retail level of transmission and what have you to get to their individual loads. Did that have any direct impact or even indirect impact on MWD and what it paid for? The biggest concern with Metropolitan was that we had some long-term contracts. I spent 10 years of my life renegotiating the Hoover contract, which was very integral to our operation, and we didn't want to lose that resource. It was a very cost-effective resource, uh, running about 8 mils per kilowatt hour, where it's a thousandth of a dollar. Uh, where comparable resources were running 100. And uh, we didn't want to lose that basic resource. We didn't want to lose our Parker resource. And we had a transmission grid that we completely developed ourselves, And we had a very unique nature to our electrical load. Uh, we fit those resources to meet our needs. And then we integrated our operation with Edison Company so that any of the resources that would did not need on our load could be used to their benefit and then we would negotiate basically how to balance those benefits so that uh, we could be share 
in combining our operation with Edison Company. Our load fit very well with Edison, as did the generation. And so basically through much of that, I wasn't a big believer in the new market, uh, somewhat considered a dinosaur, I guess, in that regard. And it might be considered blasphemy, I still have my reservations about the new market and whether or not it's working properly. Uh, the power exchange went by the wayside in the early 2000s. I was on that board and helped perform, develop some of their governance structure. We were keeping our fingers very active in all of the power restructuring because we wanted to be sure that our interests weren't jeopardized. We didn't want to be an obstacle to this moving forward because it was going to happen, but we did not want to have it cost us substantial amounts of money when we had already gone through developing our own resources, our own loads, uh, and uh, generation and transmission for it. So basically it was a simple choir, uh, cry of much of the municipalities as well as MET who joined that group of basic honor existing contracts. And by that we were able to keep our transmission we were able to keep our existing integration agreement with Edison, all of our contracts with the federal government, and relatively maintain a low uh, energy cost relative to many of the other changes that were going on in the marketplace. In a, in a general sense, how would you characterize Metropolitan's uh, menu of, of power availability? They, they take Hoover Power first, I presume, and or Parker Power first because it's cheapest. Uh, and then where do they go from there is they need more and more power. Um, first of all, before we get further into this, this was something I was going to offer early on uh, in the tape. But basically, I have not worked in the area for a, in a focused effort since I retired on the power end. Occasionally people call me up with questions and stuff, so I didn't do any review for this interview, and a lot of this is my recall of what took place a number of years ago, uh, both on the water and on the power end of things, so it needs to be viewed in that light. Um, but now we get back to the basic issues of how we integrated our resources. Our load on the Colorado River Aqueduct was fairly simple load. We put on a string of pumps. The pumps were five pumping plants, Intake Gene, Iron Eagle Hines, uh, represented about 35 megawatts of electrical load. And we put those on a string of eight of them, which would fill the aqueduct right up to the top of the aqueduct. Uh, at about 2,000 second feet, cubic feet per second, on January 1st, and we shut that load off on December 31st. Or not really shut it off, just continue. So we had a peak demand of that 35 megawatts times 8, which was somewhere in the neighborhood of almost 300 megawatts, that would operate on a flat base load basis around the clock, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Uh, there were times with pump outages, certain shutdowns of the aqueduct, etc., but it could all be predicted. It isn't like a daily load of an electric utility where that load peaks during the day when people are going to work, turning on lights, industrial loads are coming on, air conditioning loads are coming on, and the utilities don't have a way of scheduling all of the details of that operation, so they have to have generation on their system that essentially will follow that load. And they've got governors on there and what have you that actually follow the load up, follow it down. On our situation, we did not require that level of regulation. We knew what it was. We could set the generators exactly where they needed to cover our load, and unless the transmission line went, uh, was interrupted or something, we met that demand. So we would go ahead and basically take our hydro resources, which were from Hoover Power Plant and Parker Power Plant, to meet our peak demands during the day, 
which again, you know, it was 290 megawatts and the peak demand during the day was the same at night, but since the power resources were more expensive during the day, we would use those low cost resources that were the same whenever we used them during the day and then any resources that we needed to fill out the rest of our 290 megawatt demand during the nighttime when the rates were the cheapest, we would buy in the energy market. And up till 87, we were pretty well restricted in that energy market to buying it from Edison Company, which is one of the things that we insisted on on the renewal, that we be able to buy that from any source. And you mean the Hoover renewal? Right. Okay. Under the Hoover renewal, which expired in 87, uh, we were successful in renegotiating that for providing any additional power, which saved a significant amount of money. The Edison rates were attractive in the off-peak, but there were substantially lower prices than, than Edison out there. We could buy from uh, the federal government. Uh, in fact, we did buy some from Glen Canyon even in the early days. Um, but we could buy from the energy market, the new uh, California Power Exchange, wherever we could get it. So we'd use our hydro resources to meet our peak demands, and then in the off-peak we would look around to buy power in the... Uh, the off-peak, and that would pretty well equal our, our total load. And because the hydro resources were so unique, they're very cost-effective for following utility load curves, we would integrate our operation with Edison Company where they would use our Hoover power to follow their load and provide our generation from their big base load generation, which would be their coal-fired power plants and their nuclear plants, plants that they usually just put on to meet their base requirements around the clock. And that creates major benefits for Edison to try and spin some of their units, their oil units and what have you, to follow load is not very cost effective. It's very expensive and it saves Edison a significant amount of money. And out of those benefits, uh, that's one of the things out of the renewal that we, we received a couple hundred million extra kilowatt hours a year at no cost, so to speak, because that was some of the benefits that they derived out of using that peaking capability out of Hoover Dam. And that 200 million kilowatt hours was the equivalent of pumping about 100,000 acre foot, about 10% of the overall load on the Colorado River Aqueduct for free every year. So again, made some major benefit saves for Metropolitan. Uh, we should point out operationally, you, you made note of Metropolitan's five pumping plants uh, and, and then with regard to power usage and pumping water, each of those, I just want to make this clear for anyone that's listening, is each of those plants includes nine pumps and the plants have to match. You have to have, if you're going to run one pump at one plant, then they all have to be on one. And as you noted, uh, eight pumps would fill the Colorado River Aqueduct, but Metropolitan could operate with two pumps at each plant or four pumps at each plant or a number of variables. But anyway, we, did, we had the number five, which is the total number of pumping plants, and then uh, nine pumps at each plant. So, okay, so we, we got that clear. That's correct. That's the background. And, and basically, once we started the flow on the aqueduct with some minor adjustment capability at our first two plants at Intake and Gene. Once the water was flowing, there was no reservoirs at the individual plants along the way. We'd have to pump it or it would get spilled. So that's why, in essence, when we were on a one-pump flow, all five plants were on. We would use a little bit of the flexibility we would have in Copper Basin Reservoir, which is just uh, downstream of, of Gene pumping plant. I mean, a gene uh, plant, it's actually upstream. They have to pump up the hill to get it up there. But in that reservoir, there's a little bit of extra capacity in there. And we would actually use it to, at times, shut down and go from an eight-pump flow at gene and intake to a zero flow at those two plants, use the reserve storage in Copper Basin to maintain the, sto the flow downstream of there. And this would be for an hour or two, not long duration, but that would provide additional capacity to Edison system. And then instead of coming back on at an eight pump flow and maintaining the reservoir at a lower level at copper, we'd go to a nine pump flow 
and actually fill the reservoir back up and that allows additional peaking capability on Edison's system. Again, some of the benefits that they derived out of that, uh, out of our uh, coordination agreement that we have with them. Okay, I, I want to get into, uh, of course, uh, the, the Hoover contract negotiations uh, because that's probably the major theme here today. But let's let's deal with Parker first, and and, I, and then I think we can set that aside fairly quickly. One of the enduring tales is that Metropolitan Water District paid for half of Parker, and thereby uh, they receive one half the power produced at Parker in perpetuity. I mean, that's the shorthand, that's the story. Is that accurate, or is it yes. more complicated than that? Uh, the actual construction of Parker Dam was more complicated than that because we were <laughs> at war with Arizona at the time, and that's why the powerhouse at Parker resides over in California right now. But. Uh, in any event, the federal government did required ownership of the facility. We needed a desilting basin for our intake plant, and so we basically, I believe we paid 100% of the cost of the dam and 50% of the cost of the power plant, and basically received one half of the power output of the facility. It's not a huge facility, but if I recall right, I think there's 225 million kilowatt hours a year that we roughly get from that facility, one half of the power output, and it will also pump roughly 100,000 acre feet per year through the aqueduct. So, you know, another 10% comes from that half of the power production. But we did, we paid for one half of the power output, the United States paid for the other half, and later on, that half was combined with the construction and the power output from Davis Power Plant, hence the Parker Davis project. Sometime in the mid-50s, those projects were combined, and they have their own host of power customers from that combined power project. But the basic half, the 50% that Metropolitan gets, is at perpetuity and for our use, for our purposes. Uh, and we should note that for those unfamiliar with the area, the Parker Dam forms Lake Havasu. It's the southern end of Lake Havasu. And Metropolitan's intake that Bob has referred to is actually in Lake Havasu. It takes water out of Lake Havasu. Okay, great. And, and with that, you know, uh, again, the project was primarily built there at that location. There are some flood control benefits as well that are derived at that location. But it does provide a desilting basin for our intake works, etc. And lo and behold, wasn't foreseen at the time back in the 20s when we built it, or the 30s, but the Central Arizona project now on the other side of the river have the benefit of that entire facility and, and didn't have to pay anything for it. That's true. They're, you're, you're absolutely right. Their uh, buckskin intake uh, dips into Metropolitan's Lake Havasu. Okay, we'll, we'll, let, we'll let that one go. <laughs> uh, okay, the original Hoover, Hoover Dam uh, built during the 30s. Uh, original contract uh, for power was signed long before you and I were around. Uh, probably in 1937, 1938, somewhere in that time frame. And uh, so you're working away at MWD and lo and behold, 87 is approaching and, and these contracts, which are, I presume, quite favorable to uh, Metropolitan, LA, DWP, uh, whoever had rights to the power, uh, and now they're going to be renegotiated. Uh, so what was your task? What were some of the issues? Uh, what, uh, what was Metropolitan looking for out of the renewal, and uh, were there other entities standing in the way? And, and how, how difficult was it to, to gain eventually what is a 30-year renewal, I guess, from 1987 until, uh, well, they're coming right back up here for renewal. Uh, okay, very long question, but I'll, th I'll throw that to you. Number of issues out there, Arizona and Nevada wanted additional portions of the power plant because it was very cost-effective. <laughs> you know, 8 mils versus 100 mils for the alternative at the time. Um, there were other entities within California that wanted some of the power resource. Uh, many of the resale cities, again, they didn't like buying their extra power from Edison Company. They would have rather gone out and 
got the power at the lower cost, eight mils per kilowatt hour. And there were some issues in the contract at the time on a right of renewal when the 50 years were up because the existing contractors had paid for it. In the early days, uh, there weren't the loads over in Arizona and Nevada. And if you really look at most of the revenues that were derived to pay for the dam and the power plant, uh, most of those came from California, whether it was the Department of Water and Power that had a big piece of the action, Southern California Edison, or Metropolitan Water District. And uh, you look at the who paid the costs of the facilities, even though it was a federal facility, uh, it was pretty well financed in California. Uh, but there were some obligations to provide some of the power to Arizona and Nevada, and they grew into their demands. Many of those issues that came up at that time, it's my understanding they're starting to surface again because the 30-year contract expires in 2017. And I'd rather not go into the details of a lot of the negotiations that went on. I recall some of them back at that time, but some of those issues they're basically working on as we speak, and I think anything that I provide on this thing may jeopardize those negotiations, and I don't wish to do that. Okay, well, who are the parties, though, to these negotiations? Uh, so certainly Metropolitan Water District and the okay, federal government. The players at the time back then in the negotiations, federal government, who actually owns the contract, operates the power plant, um, Department of Water and Power, City of L.A., Southern California Edison, Metropolitan Water District, and at that time it was Glendale, Burbank, and Pasadena, who aren't really the, quote, resale cities of Edison. They are on the fringe of L.A. and have their own service areas. And then there's the resale cities, which Anaheim comes to mind, um, like Pasadena, Azusa, Pasadena, um, well, Pasadena is one of the ones that's close to L.A., uh, but Azusa, Banning, uh, I, I don't, there's eight resale cities and I don't recall right now, at one time I knew all their names, but they don't remember my name either, so. Uh, <laughs> well, we don't know that. <laughs> um, anyhow, uh, there were a lot of players at the table. And over in Arizona, they had their own entity for the state of Arizona that was negotiating for the state of Arizona. They had an entity that was recognized, as they did in Nevada. California didn't have that entity, other than we were somewhat collectively represented through the Colorado River Board. Was there any particular, the original contract was 50 years, the renewal in 87 was 30 years. Was there any particular reason for it? A 30-year instead of a 50-year contract? Uh, yes. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll get into the deal. The original was for 50 years. Uh, the government was going through the process of renegotiating the contracts, and the various terms that they were looking at on many of their federal, the original 50 years, that was the standard for a Federal Energy Regulatory Commission license on a hydro facility, 50 years. Basically that was a sufficient period of time to allow an entity to recoup their capital costs for building the facility and then they'd have to get another license after the 50 year term was up. So hence they followed that tradition and made it 50 years at Hoover. Under the renewal, the federal government was looking at much shorter times because the power industry was changing more rapidly and they thought it would keep their flexibility and negotiating shorter terms. I think over on the Parker Davis project they were doing it in 20-year windows. I had heard of some discussion of 10-year windows and so the initial discussion was 20 years. After lawsuits were filed, many negotiating sessions were held, we were getting close to the end and actually somebody called me up and asked me, Is, are we there? And I said, I don't want to have to renegotiate this thing again, so make it 30 years. And that got us 30 years. <laughs>
Well, I guess when you think about it, the, the changes that have occurred in this country, especially in the Western United States, from 1937 to 1987 are, are staggering, you know, compared to what happened between 87 and what is likely to happen in 2017. I mean, okay, we got the computer and we got faster airplanes and whatnot, but when you think of the settling of the West, uh, the period uh, 37 to 87, is, it blows your mind. Right. So, you know, if I was well, another thing, though, in terms of the resource, and, and it was, you know, like I said, it was kind of the last thing on the table, and we succeeded in getting a 30-year term. It was a little bit more complicated than that, I'm sure, from the federal government's perspective. A 30-year term represented what they were generally looking at in many of the generating resources, uh, whether it be a coal plant or something else that was allowed in rate base for the utilities and stuff, 30-year amortization periods was what they were looking at and when they were going to have to go in and do some major rework of a coal plant. And the other thing is, when you're planning an electric system, you need to have some assurance of the resource being there for a period of time when you're putting out all these dollars and making and planning your loads and generation resources. In other words, are you going to go spend another $2 billion on another peaking generating unit for your system if you know that you're going to have a hydro resource there for 30 years, you may not go build that generating plant. If it might be gone in 10 years, knowing that it takes almost 10 years to license a plant today, you might have to go build it and you're going to have to build extra resources. So there were some other considerations in arriving at that 30 year and I'm hopeful that that term holds out of this renewal process that they're going through right now because it is a very substantial resource and if they're really trying to minimize the amount of added generating facilities and what have you you put on a system with the uncertainties that surround every renegotiation, especially one of that nature, which takes almost 10 years to negotiate, 30 years is a reasonable time frame as well. One, one more item on, on Hoover that comes to mind, and this probably has nothing to do with the negotiations, but I'll ask you to comment on it because I happen to be directly involved in the uh, uh, in the new visitor center at Hoover Dam, and I there was I had nothing to do with how it was being paid for. I, mean, I didn't care one way or the other. But it seemed to me there was some controversy at the time that that the visitor center was being paid for by the wrong people, or the power people were paying for the visitor center, and not the one. It seems like a like a, a fly on the uh, or a gnat on the butt of an elephant. But uh, those are the kinds of things that really get people talking and get their heads shaking. I, well. The issues with the visitor's facility were that Hoover Dam, Hoover Power Plant is an engineering wonder, really is, and people today love to go through that facility. It's a, quite a monument, especially when you realize that it was constructed in the 30s by six agencies, under budget, and the whole power plant, the whole kit and caboodle, granted it was in the time of the Depression, $65 million facility. The visitor's facility, granted we're going 50 years forward in time, but the visitor's facility was, I don't remember the final numbers, but it was over $130 million for a visitor's facility. And I think the preliminary estimates were in the neighborhood of 80 to $90 million, which is still an eye-opener even in today's world, so somebody can see an engineering fee. And the Hoover contractors, that was one of the things that was on the table. They also wanted to build a bridge across and thought they could add that into rate base too because we paid off the 65 million, so we just throw a few little extra breadcrumbs here and there. And we definitely put our foot down on the bridge. We thought the visitor's facility, there were some safety issues involved. The original plant didn't provide for all the visitors that were using some old elevators. The overall movement of people through the power plant, although it didn't, you know, if it was a major problem for the safety and what have you, they just wouldn't allow it. But it was very cumbersome. Uh, people could were standing in line on that road that connects Nevada and Arizona. 
kids would play, they'd get out. There were, I believe, one or two kids that were killed that would get out in the street, what have you. So one of the things that got on the, on the table in the negotiation was to build a visitor's facility. The power customers agreed to it, and we didn't know how much it was going to cost. <laughs> okay. And it cost a ton. Uh, to some extent, I think it was gold-plated. We went ahead and uh, tried to put the controls that we could on the federal government through the various operating committees that we formed. And I think basically developed a joint effort with the Bureau to minimize the power impacts on the power people because they even the financial impacts. Fi financial impacts. And so there are fees being charged now where before it was free to go through the facility. Um, and there's a number of different items that they develop revenue sources. There, you take a little boat ride around Lake Mead and the revenue that comes out of that goes towards and, and, you know, you're talking at least a million visitors a year to that facility. And, you know, a million here, <clears throat> charge them three bucks, that's three million dollars towards amortizing that big cost. It really adds up. And so uh, we did form a joint powers agency we, for that effort and have tried to minimize the cost. I still don't, the facility was very expensive in any give and take of the word and one of the hard pills to, to swallow, but we still got a resource that was only eight mils per kilowatt hour. There you, there you go. And I don't know what the rate is now. That's what it was when I retired. I'm sure there's been some O&M increases and what have you. Well, let's talk a little bit about your involvement. Uh, well, firstly, anything else on Hoover that... Uh, I think really right now, uh, Hoover is very integral to our Colorado River Aqueduct. Um, it provides much of the peaking capacity to meet our peak demands, even though Edison uses that. Um, I believe the overall energy that we get out of there is 1.3 billion. That will pump 650,000 acre foot. So you take the 650,000 acre feet we pump from Hoover, you take another 100,000 that we get out of Parker, you take another 100,000 that you get out of the benefit energy, that's 850,000 acre foots. That's roughly uh, three fourths of our aqueduct pumping comes from these low cost resources we then buy in the market. So Hoover is really integral to that whole process. We build our transmission line into Hoover power plant. Uh, the only thing I can say, Southern California, basically all of Metropolitan's customers paid for Hoover Dam and the power plant. Uh, whether it be Edison customers or DWP customers, they're all water customers of MET, and pretty much that entire facility was there to provide re-regulation of the river so it could be used by other states, and the people that paid for the dam power plant, if you look at the revenues that went into it, were primarily here in California. You said dam and power plant, by the way, not dam power plant. But just <laughs> Sometimes I have used that scenario for referring to them, but uh, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, you were at the forefront uh, at Metropolitan in the early 1980s. Uh, you know, people talk today about green energy and uh, recycling and recover and all that kind of stuff. But uh, in the early 80s, Metropolitan moved into a small hydro, uh, in, in pipeline hydro taking advantage of potential energy and falling water, uh, probably spent more money than they needed to only because they were ahead of themselves. Uh, they were ahead of time. and it, it, Ultimately, we don't have paid off. Uh, but what, what kind of negotiations or what kind of discussions were going on at that time? Because energy was relatively cheap and Metropolitan is spending millions of dollars installing what are now 15 or 16 small hydro plants. Uh, how did you, where was the board on that? How did they get talked into that kind of an investment at a time when we weren't thinking green? The issue was whether or not the projects could pay for themselves. Originally, when we built 
the Colorado River Aqueduct and we get the water here to the coastal plain. It required lifting the water some 1,600 feet in the air if you look at the collection of the five pumping plants and the elevations they pump through. Once they get there, the last pumping plant is our Heinz pumping plant and it flows by gravity from there into Lake Matthews. And from there, it then flows into our distribution system and throughout, and this was all prior to the state water project as well, but we had excess head, which is the pressure that is in the water that could not be delivered to our member agencies or blow their valves apart. So we built pressure control facilities to basically break that head, reduce the pressure on it, so that we could distribute it through our system. And the issue was even looked at back in the 30s when our system was built. Hey, these pressure control facilities, we could build generators there. And they looked at the cost of building the generators and putting them at these pressure control facilities and the amount of power that we could get from that generation. And when oil was running, believe it or not, back then, a dollar a barrel, uh, it just wasn't cost effective. Well, as we were going into the latter, actually it was the latter part of the 70s, 75 forward, we started looking at this. That's when the oil embargo was kicking off. Oil was, I don't know, heading up to $50 a barrel or more, even back at that time. Uh, we ran some very conservative numbers on, or 50 mils per kilowatt hour. It, it wasn't up to $50, I think it was 30 to $40 a barrel at the time. In any event, um, we ran some very conservative estimates in terms of what our demands were good, going to be so that we could actually determine the amount of energy we would generate with it. You know, you might be able to generate a megawatt for an hour, but if you don't do it all day, you don't have much of a resource to market. So we had to figure out how much energy, and we used conservative estimates. We used conservative values on what the energy price is that we could derive for the sale of that power. And based upon that, went through looking at the economics of whether or not the generators would pay for themselves. And if they had, and I don't recall the actual detail of it, I think it was a payback of the capital cost of the facility within five to seven years, we'd go ahead and build the facility. And that's pretty much judged whether or not we would put any of the power plants internal to our distribution system. And there were some of them that were off of the state water project as well. They had more head on them because they were going over the Tehachapi Mountains to, through that pump lift. And in any event, uh, we developed them in phases. I think there were three phases. And we marketed them accordingly. The first five phases, uh, first five generators, phase one, we marketed it collectively and we basically canvassed the market to see who was interested in buying it. We went out to Edison Company, we went out to the resale cities, Glendale, Burbank, and Pasadena, as well as the Anaheims and what have And we asked DWP, um, California State Department of Water Resources, uh, because their contracts were up for reconsideration in 1983. Uh, they were looking for additional resources, and we basically took the highest bidder. And we're successful in doing that with uh, the various phases. And uh, things were pretty much up in the air, but it was at a time that with the oil embargo, us trying to reduce our dependence on oil, saying we, I mean California and the rest of the country, uh, for the most part, much of the power was being marketed to Edison because they would have the highest cost. They were very dependent upon oil and their avoided cost, the cost that they wouldn't be generating from would be oil fire generation. And because of that, they could offer more for the resource. And so we locked up many of the contracts with them. However, in 83, we did dedicate the first five plants to Edison, to DWR under a long-term group of contracts. The others were marketed primarily to Edison, with I think one exception, Etiwanda went to PG&E, and that was kind of the last unit that we brought online. It wasn't in phases one through three, it was in the last 
generator that we constructed. We marketed that to PG&E. And I think we still sell that to them through a combination of agreements. But the first one was the DWR on a 20-year or longer contract. And I believe that still exists. The others were marketed to Edison. Those contracts expired in 2003. I believe that was the time. And I don't know what the current status is on who they're being marketed to. Uh, but in any event, if you look at all the costs of that program, I think within five years, the capital costs of constructing those projects was fully paid off. So it was a real money maker for Metropolitan. Say money maker, it helped offset the power costs that went into getting that extra head on that water so that we could generate once we got it in Southern California, but it was a major cost saving uh, program for Metropolitan. And, and that continues today. And that continues to this day. I'm not sure that we get as high of prices as we used to, but uh, we're, well, I don't know what's in the new contracts right now. All right, uh, then let's move lastly, with regard to power anyway, let's move to the State Water Project, um, an area that I don't know a heck of a lot about in terms of how their power contracts work. Uh, so what was, what was your involvement with power usage on the State Water Project? And, Primarily up through 1983, 84, I had primarily focused on the Colorado River aqueduct power resources and then started working on some of the state water project items at that time and began familiarizing myself with the power operations on the state water project. Much more complex than the Colorado River aqueduct. Uh, they do have reservoirs along their system. They are able to, in essence, shut down their pumps, or at least when the flow was less, during the on-peak period when the energy was most expensive, and they would take their hydro resources and baseload resources, market them in the outside market to the extent they could, and then buy their energy in the off-peak. Um, and I started familiarizing myself with their resources. Um, the Most of the negotiation that had developed at that time, Edison, or uh, DWR. DWR was working under some long-term contracts that expired in 83. Okay, let, let me have you hold that thought only because we're running out of tape here. And uh, I'm gonna stop and uh, we'll take a few minutes to change tape and we'll pick this back up again at uh, at the point where DWR is uh, uh, manipulating their power system for the benefit of the users and how all that went okay. and what you had to do with it. So hang on.